Hi everybody, the circular flow of income is a very useful way of modeling the economy. And from this model, we can derive two very important conclusions. One conclusion is how we can look at economic growth. The second conclusion is how we can measure economic growth, i.e. how we can get to GDP. Well, let's get straight into it, shall we? So in our very simple economy here, we've got two fundamental economic agents. We've got households and we have firms or businesses. Households provide their four factors of production to firms in the form of land, labor, capital, and enterprise, those four fundamental factors of production. They go to firms. What do firms do with those factors of production? They combine them and they make goods and services out of them. In reward, in return for providing their factors of production, households receive factor incomes from firms. That's the reward for providing the factors of production. Each factor of production has a reward. Let's take labor. The reward to labor is wages and salaries. The reward for land is rent. The reward for entrepreneurship is profit. The reward for capital is interest. So these are the four factor incomes that households receive. And what do they do with those incomes? They spend them on the goods and services made by firms. So if we model all of that, we get this. This is a very simple model of the economy. It's the circular flow of income the movement of spending and income throughout the economy, that's what we have. But it's very clear from this model that we've simplified things far too much. We've ignored two fundamental sectors of the economy. You could argue we've ignored the government completely. They have a very important role to play in an economy and also the international sector as well. Well, we can add that to our model here. So let's look at factor incomes. We've assumed that all incomes earned by households are gonna be spent on goods and services in the economy. That's a ludicrous assumption. Not all of the income that we earned is actually spent in the economy. We can do other things with that income. For example, we could save a part of that income. Savings, known as S. What else could happen to our income? It could be taxed away, introducing government here. Absolutely. It could be taxed away, taxation, known as T. What else could happen? We don't have to spend our incomes on goods and services made in our economy necessarily. We could spend some of it on goods and services made abroad. Import spending. Import spending. Imports here, known as M. The letters are important. We need to know the letters here. So these are ways in which Incomes that are earned in the economy may leak out of the circular flow, may not be spent directly on goods and services produced in our economy. These three, S, T, and M, are known as leakages, are known as leakages from the circular flow. Another name is also withdrawals, how incomes can go out of the economy and not be spent on goods and services produced in the economy. But at the same time, we've assumed that the only expenditure on goods and services produced in our economy is going to be by households, is going to be by consumers. Well, that's another crazy assumption. There are many other ways in which expenditure can take place on goods and services made in an economy. Firms could spend. That's known as investment. That's known as investment. The letter I. Who else can spend on goods and services made in our economy? Government. Government can. So there could be government spending, and government spending is denoted by the letter G. Who else can spend on goods and services in an economy? Well, foreigners can, right? When they buy goods and services made in our economy, that's known as exports for us. So exports here, denoted by the letter X. Absolutely, so you have investment. The technical definition for, for investment is when firms spend on capital goods. So when firms spend on capital goods, investment, Government spending and exports, these three things are known as injections into the circular flow. Ways in which money can enter our economy outside of consumer expenditure. Investment, government spending and exports. So we have injections and we have leakages, ways in which we can bring in the government, ways in which we can bring in the international sector. This is now known as the four sector circular flow, a much more realistic view of our economy. Fantastic, done with that. But how can we get to these two fundamental conclusions? Let's understand. By comparing the level of injections and leakages, we can show whether the economy is growing or not. So looking here, if injections are greater than leakages, there is more money entering the economy than is leaving it, then economic growth is going to be rising. If vice versa, if the level of injections are less than the 
level of leakages, it means more money is going to be exiting our economy than is going to be entering it. Therefore, economic growth is going to be decreasing. And if the two are equal to each other, economic growth will neither be increasing nor decreasing. Therefore, we call that macroeconomic equilibrium. Leakages and injections are in balance. They are equal to each other. So we can illustrate economic growth using our circular flow of income, but we can also get to an actual figure of GDP, our measure of economic growth too. GDP is our measure of economic growth, standing for gross domestic product here. And if we can measure any one of these three things in our circular flow of income, we can get a precise number for GDP. And then year on year, we can see if that number is rising or falling. And therefore, we can precisely measure economic growth. Well, let's have a look how we can do that from our circular flow. We can measure number one. Number one is known as the output method of calculating GDP. And that is looking at the final value of all goods and services produced in an economy in a year. So adding up the final value of all goods and services produced in an economy in a year, that is the output method of getting to GDP. We could also calculate number two, the income method, by adding up all the factor incomes earned in an economy in a year. That is adding up all wages and salaries. That's adding up all profit, all interest and all rent. All the four factor incomes, add them up and we get the income method to get to GDP. Or we can add up the total expenditure on a country's goods and services in a year. That's consumer expenditure. That's investment, that's government spending and it's net exports. C plus I plus G plus in brackets X minus M. That's also the equation for aggregate demand, which we're going to see later in this playlist. The total expenditure on all goods and services produced in an economy in a year is the expenditure method. That's our third way of getting to GDP here. Fantastic. Does it matter which one we use? No, because all three are going to be equal to each other. Output equals income equals expenditure. Obviously, we are measuring the same circular flow of income. Therefore, we can't have three different numbers. They're all trying to indicate the same flow. And therefore, by definition, they're all going to be equal to each other. The other very logical, intuitive way of looking at it is by looking at an example of a transaction in an economy. I love cricket, guys. Let's make that very clear. I absolutely adore cricket. So let's say I go to a cricket shop and I'm looking to buy a cricket bat. My spending on that cricket bat is going to be equal to the value of that output. It's going to be equal to the price of the cricket bat, the value of the output. Absolutely. And when I spend, my money is going to go to the shop owner in the form of income for the shop owner. So my spending on the cricket bat is equal to the value of the cricket bat, the value of the output, which then becomes the income of the shop owner. Spending equals output equals income. The three are always going to be equal to each other whenever a transaction takes place in the economy. Therefore, it doesn't matter which method we use, we're going to get to GDP. Therefore, we're going to get a measure of economic growth and we can see how that number changes over time. That is the power of the circular flow. Not just getting a model, but also giving us two fundamental conclusions. That's it. That's all you need to know. Thank you so much for watching, guys. I'll see you all in the next video.